I was nothing like the book. I can't remember which American writer it was. I heard him speak and he said uh, that his job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. But plenty of other things about the testers did not impress Nash. When he felt particularly uncharitable, he found them entitled in this very dumb and tedious way. Oddly enough, for all their sarcasm and easy, shallow irony, there was still not enough self-reference for him. Not enough wit. There was self-obsession, yes, self-consciousness, sure. After all, they always lived as though their lives were all on the verge of broadcast, but no concern with self-implication. Just that ungenerous righteousness, as if merely being young was somehow to your credit. <laughs> Suck it, young people in the 90s. Welcome to Books You Haven't Read. My name is Nate Rankin. That is Noam Chomsky. In the studio audience today, we have got the one and only Billiam Shakespeare. Billiam, how you doing? When I was a young what? King Lear, right? Eat the document. The 2005 National Book Award nominated novel by Dana Spiotta. So I want to start off by talking about the title of this book. Eat the Document is a documentary about Bob Dylan's 1966 European tour. Uh, this was shot by D.A. Pennebaker, but edited by Dylan himself. And ABC originally had the exclusive rights to it, but they ended up passing on it once they saw Dylan's cut because they deemed it too incoherent for a modern audience. And if you watch the actual documentary, it's very much a cinema verite, kind of Bob Dylan's particular impressions of that tour. There is a lack of kind of narrative plot um, that was present in sort of the preceding documentary that same filmmaker D.A. Pennebaker had made, had made the year before. That one's called Don't Look Back. Eat the Document has, uh, it was released kind of nominally, I think maybe at a festival or there was some kind of showing of it in 1972. Uh, but it has never existed um, in commercial release, okay? It has always existed as a bootleg since the 70s, uh, even to this day. Now that's important because uh, bootleg culture and sort of the cultural as well as historical detritus of the early 70s uh, comes to play a big part of the setting for when the primary actions of the novel take place, which is in the late 90s. So the actual plot of this book. Uh, Eat the Document concerns uh, the lives of a couple different leftist radicals in both the early 70s and early, in late 1990s. We start off with uh, Mary Whitaker and Bobby DeSoto in 1972. One of their radical protests against the Vietnam War goes awry. We don't get exactly how it goes awry until about page 200, uh, but it's not that hard to figure out. Hint, it's a kind of boom boom terrorism! So the primary action of the novel ends up taking place in about 1998, and uh, Mary Whitaker is, who has changed her name to Louise by this point, is one of the primary characters, and there are four others. One of them is Jason, her son, uh, and he is a really big fan of the Beach Boys and has a bunch of their bootleg albums. Another is Nash, who is the owner of a leftist radical bookstore. Another one is Miranda, who is a love interest to Nash and pretty young. I, I don't know if it gives an exact age, but she's like 19. And then there is uh, Henry, who is a bartender friend of Nash's and has cancer and also PTSD from the Vietnam War, maybe? The reason that I read this book, uh, I'm a big fan of Dana Spiotta. One of my... Um, goals of this year is to finish the uh, sort of novels of a bunch of different novelists that I really like, uh, including Dana Spiotta. She actually has a book called Wayward coming out this summer, so I'll also be reading that. This is by far her best known novel. Books that get nominated for the National Book Award typically are always in some way trying to make a statement or trying to be about some kind of Americanness. Uh, it can be really broad. The reason this book interests me is because, for one, I'm very interested in not only the Cold War era, but the consequences of the Cold War era. And it's a really interesting look at something I'm personally interested in, which is kind of the history of American leftism. We reached a bit of a peak of leftism in the late 60s, early 70s, 
and then it had really subsided, I would say, um, kind of around in the late 90s. Okay, so I'm gonna do the rest of the video with spoilers because there are just a couple details that I don't really want to uh, tiptoe around, so... Spoilers! So at this point I should say that the character Nash uh, is Bobby DeSoto, that's what he's changed his name to. And Nash lives in a communal household that's full of mostly young leftists who uh, are kind of all living together and creating these ad hoc groups and, and ideas for demonstrations to sort of figure out how they can uh, use their leftism to affect change in the world. And Nash is kind of the guide of a lot of these meetings and conversations. Uh, none of these actions ever really take place. Uh, a lot of them just end up as uh, people meeting and talking about radical ideas, but never actually taking action. And this is where Miranda comes in. Miranda, um, you know, being young and idealistic, she really objects to this and wants to find ways to take meaningful action. Nash's role in this uh, is to almost seek a, a, a leftism uh, within the self, within the heart. I think this is really well summed up from page 65. Miranda is talking to Nash, kind of criticizing him over these things, and this is how Nash responds. The point isn't to win. They'll never win, of course. They just make persuasive and powerful the beauty of their opposition. So for Nash and for maybe leftism in general in the 90s, opposition is theatrical, it's symbolic, um, but it's not actually, it has no place in the real world. As for the character Mary, we get her entire arc from 72 to 98. Throughout these years, she has to construct various different identities. She constantly has to leave new friends and new groups of friends that she makes uh, in kind of the dead of night. She meets a guy in 1982, has a kid with them, he dies shortly thereafter and isn't a big part of the novel, uh, and she tells neither the guy nor her son uh, her true identity. And this whole uh, active construction of identity as an adult forces her to become a secret agent in her own life. And I really uh, appreciated that aspect of the novel. I think to some degree not to the degree that the character Mary does, but to some degree we all experience that, that kind of constructing an identity and uh, this fear of being found out. Uh, I think that's a, a constant process you go through as an adult, um, even and especially as an adult. It obviously exists uh, when you're young, but that's to be expected, and the kind of unexpected part comes from when you're still doing it as an adult. And this ties back into the documentary, Eat the Document, the title because Dylan is going through his own change of identity in 1966 uh, when he has just gone electric and when people, um, you know, are very, uh, they, there's a high level of animosity to him. The novel is most effective when it's exploring authenticity, both authenticity of self and uh, the authenticity of ideologies. Uh, the most uh, sort of effective leftism that's actually happening in this book goes again back to uh, the bootlegs. The proliferation and the sharing of these artifacts, whether they are, uh, you know, a lost album from the Beach Boys, because Jason is really into the Beach Boys, or whether it's perhaps a Bobby DeSoto produced uh, piece of leftist propaganda cinema, whatever it may be, whatever the bootleg actually may be, uh, it is the only thing that provides maybe a hope of foundation for solidarity. And that can be, I think, viewed as both tragic, but also, you know, the fact that it's rooted in art or just uh, creation in general, uh, there, there's some reason to be optimistic about that, I'll say. At the same time, capitalism just completely subsumes the left. Case in point, there's a character that Miranda, love interest of Nash, dates named Josh while she and Nash are kind of doing a will they won't they. And Josh is a hacktivist. And what that means is that he basically does kind of different digital graffiti with uh, different corporations and companies, landing pages and websites. And so, uh, you know, he makes a big goof, makes maybe a satirical slogan on their website. That ends up in Josh getting a job with one of these companies, uh, and this company is literally trying to build a commune, a, a corporately funded commune. So capitalism is totalizing in this world, in this universe of the book, and in ours, of course. You know, it 
again, makes it so that the only sort of authentic, intangible way that you can resist capitalism is by, you know, paying money for a stolen good. So that at least it's not, you know, going to the record companies or whatever. It's going to your bootleg dealer that also sells you mushrooms or something. So ultimately, I really like the concept of the book. The execution is broadly successful, though I'm not without some conniptions. Number one, Henry the bartender. Wasn't super effective for me. Didn't really think that he added a lot to the story. Number two, Miranda's role, her most important role, seemed to be the men that she was dating. I just thought, like, cut out Henry's parts and then give that space to Miranda and you can build her out and she can be a little more of her own character. But really, I think she served as a vessel to kind of compare and contrast, compare and contrast Josh and Nash. In a 290 page novel and you've got five characters, you're actually pretty thin on space and so you've got to use it really effectively. Number three, and I think this is the biggest failure of the novel, and I use failure maybe a little too strongly, um, but the character of Jason. He's the uh, only character that is in first person, and so he serves as kind of the narrator of the story. His really central conflict uh, was his investigation into his mother, and that felt uh, really rushed and really abbreviated. Again, it's a 290 page novel, kind of felt like it could have been 400, and that you should have had maybe three or four characters, you know? So like Mary, Nash, maybe Miranda, and Jason. Um, Henry, again, you can just cut out. Now, as a Dana Spiota fan, I would probably recommend uh, Stone Arabia before I would recommend this book. It also uh, has music uh, figure into it pretty prominently. Um, and Dana Spiota is like really talented at, she has a real talent for writing about music, particularly of uh, the 70s era. And that's, I believe she was born in the 70s. I think she was actually born like in the late 70s maybe, I'm not sure. Um, but she's really good uh, with that kind of writing. And I was reminded of a line from Jeff Tweedy's biography. Jeff Tweedy is the lead singer of Wilco. And he had this line that was something to the effect of um, the way he discovered a lot of music in his early days was that he would first read about it in music magazines. Um, and that he thought nowadays that kind of talent to write about and describe what music felt like or what the experience of music was, uh, was a real talent that had gone away. Uh, I think Dana Spiota absolutely has the talent to you know, write about music that you haven't necessarily understood uh, or haven't necessarily encountered before. But still, I gave it four out of five stars. So some flaws with it, um, but ultimately it was a pretty good book and it's really interesting uh, topic for me. So I think if you are uh, particularly taken with 70s culture, uh, even maybe 90s culture, uh, or leftist politics, or the history of maybe leftism as it occurred in the late 20th century, you'll be intrigued by this book. Okay, I think I got everything I wanted to say. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, please subscribe if you'd like to see more. I will be releasing videos every other week. I think that's probably the pace that I can uh, kind of most ably deliver on. I know some people out there do, you know, like a book or review a week. Uh, I'm not as good as them. So every other week for now, uh, maybe some stuff in between um, that's not book reviews but is literary related or something. I don't know. I don't know how to end videos. Suck it, young people in the 90s. And... Okay, bye.